Excellent. Welcome. Um, so this is um, an interesting webinar. I've been thinking about doing this one for some time because um, I read a lot of books and I draw uh, lessons from these books from unlikely places. So I thought it would be a good, good time to kind of share some of those lessons as we uh, you know, continue through our webinar series. Um, just some logistics as we get started. Our usual today, our host, myself, David Donaldson, as well as uh, backing us up on the technical side is Scott Roberts. So if there's any issues uh, that you have, perhaps with the sound or, or the image or anything, either just pop into the chat or fire a quick email. And as always, we do record these sessions. So if you don't, uh, if you aren't able to, to connect with us today, uh, they'll be available for you for future reference. <coughs> Excuse me. On the technical side, um, sometimes when we first start, the sound's a little bit off and just give it a few moments. Um, and we've got some user tools. At the top of your screen, you have a raise your hand. Um, if you have any questions, uh, if you want to agree, disagree, tell me to speed up, slow down, that sort of thing. For input, as always, we have our chat window down the right-hand panel. Uh, please feel free to use that throughout. <clears throat> and of course, as always, we accept applause. As usual, uh, I'm going to start our webinar today with an opening thought. And my thought comes from our very own Catherine Daw. I um, worked with Catherine for, oh my goodness, uh, a little over eight years now. Um, so she was the former owner of Title Shift. And I remember in a meeting one time, she made the comment, I'm only as good as my last book. Um, Catherine is a, is a voracious reader, um, always drawing those lessons from those books. And her comment was basically, you know, based on the last book I read, here's the, here's the lessons that, that I drew from it. And that really resonated with me when she said that at the time. So um, I thought that was a, a kind of good way to, to look at this because we are learning, we're continually learning through life and books are a fantastic way to draw lessons. And, and sometimes we can draw lessons from unlikely places. So it's going to be our kind of theme today. Well, I want to start off, however, with a question. <clears throat> And the question for you is, uh, what book would you recommend to a junior PM and why? So I've got the, the chat box down the bottom there. Please pop in and put in your book recommendation and a short statement on why you would recommend that book. From Lorena, do not have a specific, oh, do not have a specific title, but emotional intelligence help with the team dynamics communications, introduce the concepts, love it. Um, absolutely, uh, Lorena, and, and emotional intelligence is a, is a huge one, and there's a ton of really good books out there on that. Um, sometimes they're even not labeled emotional intelligence, so uh, definitely, um, uh, you know, it's a good recommendation. From Regeran, The Pinbach, I <laughs> love it, absolutely. And The Pinbach is a great book because it does give us a lot of structure and a lot of, a lot of process. Um, today, however, we're going to be looking more at the um, emotional side and the, um, you know, how to work with, with stakeholders and, and people side. Um, Behave by Sapolurki. Um, all aspects of human behaviors and why. Wow, Roberto, that sounds like a fantastic book. Um, I'm going to definitely have put that one onto my, my list and, and have a look at that. From Tracy, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, a classic. Absolutely. Great tips on relationship building. Um, oh, we have a correction on the on the spelling. Um, and um, again, as, as we're going through today, if you have any questions on um, any of the, the books that we've reviewed, um, you know, just fire me a note and, and we'll definitely, um, you know, follow up with you on those. Okay, so here is our list of books that we're going to take a look at today. Um, now, as I as I kind of went through my library and thought, what are the books that I'm, I'm going to use? There's actually a couple that um, I have on my reread list. And I like to reread them because while I've, I've read them in the past and I've, I've had those lessons learned, um, over time that sort of fades. You know, you want to bring it back to the surface, bring it back to, to um, uh, you know, but back to kind of front of mind. Um, one of the things I do, just, just to share with you, is um, I do audiobooks. So the first four of those are actually audiobooks. Um, or at least I have in an audiobook format. Um, and I, I, do, I do a lot of driving, way too much driving. So um, I often listen to them in the car. Um, so these are the, the books that we're going to take a look at today. Okay, first one, QBQ. And QBQ stands for the question behind the question. And it's really all about what are we really asking when we ask those questions, and it comes down to personal accountability. And what resonated with me with this book, 
and I, I love this one because there, there's two aspects about it I really love. First of all, it's very short, uh, which is good. On the audiobook, it's it's one CD. It's like 90 minutes or something. It's it's a great, nice, compact book. Um, and the other thing I love about it is near the end of the book, he says, "We read far too many books, especially self-help books. You know, stop reading these and, and go out and." and you know, do these things that we talk about. So what really resonated with me is that someone who is truly accountable does not blame anyone, not even themselves. Oftentimes when we talk about accountability, we think in terms of, you know, accepting the blame, <clears throat> but true accountability is about fixing the problem. You know, looking at it from a, a um, you know, what's the situation perspective and addressing it versus, you know, laying blame. And one of the stories, and this book is peppered with personal stories by, uh, by uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, one of the personal stories he had is he was driving down the road one day with his kids, and he saw a gentleman out in a field, um, and the field was strewn with newspapers. Um, so the gentleman had pulled over, and, and uh, he was he was rushing around this field trying to grab all of these papers and, and collect them up. So they stopped and gave him a hand, and um, you know, so eventually between the the four of them, they were able to gather up all the papers and get them back. And and you know, they turned to him and said, you know, like what happened? He says, well, I was driving down the road and I noticed that the papers in the back of my pickup truck were gone. Um, he had a whole load of, of newspapers and, and he realized that they'd blown out. And he actually turned back and went into the field to clean them up because he was like, you know what? It happened. We need to go fix this, right? So it's just a, a really nice story around that personal accountability. And like I say, the book is just peppered with those. It's a really good book. Um, <clears throat> the second one in my list, and this is, this is another one of my favorites, um, in my reread list is, is It's Our Ship by Captain Michael Abarashov. Um, and the, the theme of this is how to turn the ship around. Now, um, Captain Abarashov inherited the most dysfunctional ship in the Navy, but it was also the most technically advanced. So it was, it was a relatively new ship. Um, it's a, uh, I think it's a missile destroyer, if I remember correctly. Very technologically advanced. Um, you know, multiple weapon systems, uh, lots of technology. I think there was like, a, you know, four different uh, radar systems and, you know, weapons tracking and, and you know, threat tracking and, and so on and so on. Um, but the ship and its crew in particular was highly dysfunctional. So he actually turned the ship around from being the most dysfunctional ship in the Navy to having the best on station record, which means when the fleet went out, he was, his ship was part of that armada that, that, that went out and was on station. So I'm going to put a poll or a, a question to you. Um, if you were in this situation, you've just taken over the most technologically advanced ship in the fleet and the most dysfunctional ship in the fleet, how would you turn it around? What would you do to turn it around? From Tracy, ask the subject matter experts. Tracy, could I get you to expand on that a little bit for me? Because I, I think I know where you're going with that, but I want to I want to I want to see your take on this. From Roberto, uh, investigate with the crew all of the crew, what is their experience, um, has been, and listen well. So definitely very, um, you know, on the listening side and the receiving behaviors would be very key to really understand what the issues are. Uh, from Judy, uh, do a needs assessment, determine my gaps, and what needs to be done to fill those gaps. And Judy, I love that you said determine my gaps, not the crew's gaps, not the, the you know, the, the team's gap, but, you know, where, where you are, because really as a leader it's about us and we, we can control us um, we can look at how do we um, you know help better um, loving this one from La Lorena a team building exercise absolutely and in his four-year command of um, the Benfold he basically turned it into one big four-year long team building exercise which is and it, it's a really really interesting story and, and very well told because you know you, you, it feels like you're kind of going on that journey with him as he talks about all the different things that he was doing to help you know bring the team back together um from shrikanth hope i'm getting your name right um Ask questions and understand the gaps by listening carefully. Absolutely. So again, we're seeing a lot of this receptive type behaviors, the, the receiving information. Um, from Tracy, does anyone have similar experience who we can learn from? Ah, I see what you're saying. Right. So one of the things he did do is he did actually meet with other captains, um, you know, and, and, and sort of, you know, created a, um, a captain's conference. Now, he actually did that a little bit later uh, in his time, and he, he reflects back that he wished he'd done that sooner. So I'm loving that you, you picked up on that. Uh, from Diana, figure out what 
uh, figure out every person's expertise and relocate them where they can ex exceed. Love it. Yeah, and that was an, another thing he actually did is is you know really figuring out where people should be, you know, getting their expertise and and kind of building on those strengths. So some fantastic, um, uh, some fantastic uh, suggestions. Um, here's here's what really resonated for me. Respect your team, regardless of their rank, regardless of their job. Um, welcome them and value them. Now, he relates his experience when he first joined the crew. Now, he joined as a senior officer, and um, it's tradition in the Navy that when you get your appointment that you write a letter to your new captain, and the tradition is also that they, they kind of respond. So he did that. He wrote the letter to, to his, his new captain, and there was no response. And when he arrived on board, it was like, oh, yeah, the letter's here somewhere, and, and so on. So it really wasn't a very welcoming experience. And he, he kind of learned from that. And so what he did is when people were posted to his ship, before they before he received the letter from the new crew member, he actually sent them a welcome package. And it included things like, you know, a baseball cap and a bumper sticker. And, and he sent someone out to greet them at the airport when they arrived. I mean, you're talking about some folks who, you know, sometimes coming from, you know, the Midwest and they've never been out of their small town and, you know, they grew up on a farm and, you know, first time in the big city, sometimes first time on an airplane and, you know, things like this. So really, you know, looking out for his crew, making them feel welcome, making them feel like, you know, they're going to be part of something even before they arrived. So it's a really kind of cool uh, thing. And, and he did, as captain, go down and talk to everyone in even the, the, the lowest parts of the ship. Um, you know, every job is important, and, and we need to, you know, recognize that and support those folks, even when there's some, you know, kind of not really glamorous jobs that, that, that are getting done. <clears throat> okay, so the next one on our list, The Survivors Club by Ben Sherwood. Now, I put the tagline, why did I survive when my producer did not? And the opening of the book, Ben re, re, um, relates his story. He's a, he's a reporter, and he was overseas uh, covering a war zone. And there was three of them that got into this minivan for the ride from their hotel to wherever they were going that day. And there was there was two reporters and their producer, and the producer chose the middle seat. And all three of them thought, oh, the middle seat's going to be the safest. And while they were driving, a sniper's bullet killed his his producer was sitting right beside him. And I mean, you can just imagine what you would be thinking and feeling uh, if if you were in that position. But what he did is he thought um, he thought. Why did I survive when when my producer didn't? Why you know what was it that that you know allowed that to happen? And as he thought about that, he was thinking about you know why why are there some people who survive and some don't? You know you, you hear about you know a ship going down or or a plane crash or or <clears throat> you know 9/11 for example, and you know what what caused people to survive? So he set out on a bit of a quest to answer that question. And what he did in his book is he interviewed multiple survivors. So he interviewed a lady who survived Outswitch. Um, in fact, directly encountering uh, Dr. Mengele. Um, he interviewed a lady who tripped and fell uh, while going to her knitting class and was pierced through the heart with a knitting needle. Um, he interviewed airplane crash survivors, ship sinking survivors. Um, and, and he also went out and interviewed folks who run survival schools. Um, so there's, there's a gentleman in, um, uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and they call him Do Dr. Popsicle. Uh, because what he does is he studies the effects of hypothermia on the human body, and he's been, you know, purposefully gone hypothermic several times in his study, and you know, and, and looking at all these things. So not only does he look at, uh, you know, people's own personal responses, but you know, what is what is science saying, and what is the, um, you know, the expert saying? And um, so one of the things that came out of that is is there's multiple parts to survival, but survival is in part will. Uh, everyone he interviewed had a will to survive. And they drew on that to get them through. And, and you know whether that will was was being driven by just they felt like they had unfinished business on on Earth before they passed, or they had family, or maybe it was it was part of their religious faith. Um, but they drew on that and and you know held on. Um, and that's really you know kind of some of the things that that um, was was really resonating for them. Now this one, uh, the connection to managing projects might not be quite as clear. Um, what we're looking at here is, you know, we need to have a very strong will when we're we're running that project because at times it can feel like, um, you know, it, it just give up, it's done, you know. But you know, we we need to have that drive and that that will to to uh, to to keep forward and keep going when it seems like there's there's you know no hope. 
um, you know, some the, the, the rescue boat will come along, hopefully. All right. Um, our next one is the Checklist Manifesto. And this one I actually just recently got, and I've already read it twice. I'm just really in love with this book. Um, <clears throat> so Dr. Um, Gawande, uh, he was working with the World Health Organization, and they basically had a simple question. How do we improve surgical results worldwide? Now, I want to just highlight the worldwide piece, because um, Dr. Gawande is an American surgeon, and uh, he's in the Boston area. I forget which which hospital he's with. Um, so you know, there you're talking um, place in the world where you're going to have top-notch medical care. You're going to have you know the best equipment, the best staffing, you know the best training. Um, but here's the question: How do we improve the results worldwide? You know, when you go to a third-world country, where you go to somewhere that has unreliable power, that has you know, difficulty getting clean water that, that you know, is, has very few resources. Um, there was one uh, clinic that he visited where they were, were, were literally washing the, the surgical gloves and sterilizing them because they couldn't afford to throw them away um, because they just had so little resources. And um, the Checklist Manifesto, uh, what Dr. Gawande does is he looks at the world of aviation and says, you know, the world of aviation has a very high um, success rate, a very zero failure uh, policy culture. And a lot of that is driven by, um, by, by, by um, it, it's a lot driven actually by, by media, but how do they do that? And, and one of the things that he discovered is that they use checklists. So they started looking at can we use checklists in a, a surgical in a theater? And you know, how can we do that? And what does that look like? And so they actually developed a checklist. He worked with Boeing engineers uh, to develop a checklist and then pilot it around the world and had amazing results. Like they went back to their, their research and said, the, these numbers are too good. Um, I think they had something like a 60% reduction in post-surgical um, infection rates, which is, my, my goodness, that's unheard of. So huge, huge, amazing results. But the most surprising thing, and here's what really resonated for me, especially when we look at it in terms of uh, projects is the biggest factor and is uh, the, the work was to have the team introduce themselves by name before they begin. Now let's think about that in the setting of a third world operating room. You've got an emergency ER out in the middle of, of nowhere with you know really huge challenges of you know water and equipment and training and things and just having them introduce each other. Right, by name, just go around the room and say, you know, hi, I'm Dave, I'm I'm this role, and here's what I do, and hi, I'm Joe, and I'm this role, and this is what I do, and I'm Shirley, and this is my role, and this is what I do, and so on. Um, just having them do that, um, what it did is it is it made them a more coherent team. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna come we're gonna build on that in a moment, but I want to pose a, a poll question for you. You're being prepared for emergency surgery. Uh, would you prefer a coherent team, or would you prefer prefer the maverick superstar surgeon? I'll give you a few moments to answer that. I'm going to end the poll. This is very definitive results, folks. 92% are saying, I want the coherent team. <laughs> Yay! That's what I was hoping you were going to say. That was my vote. Uh, <laughs> a couple are saying that the, the maverick superstar surgeon. Um, that That's, oh, sorry, I went back to one. Um, That is a really, really interesting result because I was really curious as to where this was going to go. I mean, we, we watch the TV shows and, and you know think of, think of House and Grey's Anatomy and you know things like that, and you kind of have those maverick superstars, and um, you know. But yeah, if I'm if I'm in that that surgical OR and and I've got that that team, the team is going to outperform the individual. Yeah. You now, yes, we do want to have good, competent staff, absolutely, but we need coherency in the team, and. Uh, the book closes with a personal story where Dr. Gwende, um was doing a, a relatively routine procedure on a patient. And he nicked the, um, I want to say the carotid artery, and just like massive blood loss, right? And the team came together. Um, you know, everything was, was um, you know, just clicked, and they managed to save this, guy, this gentleman's life. Um, 
and in the post debrief analysis of what went on, um, he he really realized that you know the fact that they ran the checklist at the beginning and most importantly that they introduced each other so they know who they were and that they're able to come together as a team and function as a team is what saved this gentleman's life. Um, just a, a really, really interesting book. And um, as, as a pilot, this, this book particularly resonates with me because I do use checklists um, on a daily basis, uh, both in my flying and in my personal life, um, because it, it, they work. They, they, really, they really do work, and, and tons of stories around um, that. <clears throat> OK, moving on. Blink by Mac Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. Um, Blink, uh, I can see clearly in the blink of an eye. Now, Blink's core concept here is all about something uh, that Malcolm refers to as thin slicing. And thin slicing is kind of listening to those, um, as I like to refer it as your spidey sense, but it's listening to those niggling messages. And the book opens with this wonderful story of a, a museum curator who has just gotten you know, the, the holy grail, not, not literally the holy grail, but the, the holy grail of muse museum curators, which is the, you know, the ancient artifact that was previously undiscovered. And, um, you know, of course, there's, there's always a, um, a level of skepticism there because, of course, they're very valuable and the person bringing it to them is, you know, expecting remuneration. So it was, it was a Greek curio and they did three months of in-depth analysis of the, of the, you know, the associated documentation that came with it and, and you know, various analysis to, to prove its authentication. So they were they were preparing this for display, and there was a visiting curator from another museum. So of course, the uh, curator took his his visiting friend down to the the you know the the basement to the to the lab where they were preparing this and and showed it. And with just a glance, the visitor turned to him and says, "I hope you haven't paid for it yet." And he says, "What do you mean?" He says, "I, I think it's a fake." And you know, shocked, um, just but within just that blink of an eye, the visitor and and. The visitor was interviewed, and he says the the thing that popped to mind was fresh. This this is an ancient Greek uh, piece, so you know it's it's thousands of years old. Um, so the curator then got several other experts in, and they all said the exact same thing in the blink of that eye when they just you know took that first look, the impression that they got. Now thin slicing works. Uh, this is that subconscious piece of the mind that, that that's happening. Um, uh, there's there's some neuroscience that, that backs this up, uses a bit different language, um, but thin slicing works when you have the level of experience. Now thin slicing doesn't work that well when, when you don't have the great levels of experience. But this is when you know you have that experienced expert that has that quick look and say, mm, I can't really justify why, but this is what I think is going on. And, and I, I refer to this as, a, as my spidey sense. Because um, you know, of course, Spidey has, or Spider-Man has that, you know, that high, um, you know, attuned sense of danger. And when his Spidey sense goes, you know, there's something wrong. And of course, in that storyline, he's he's always right, and there there is always something going on. Um, but there's actually some, you know, neuroscience behind that that we as humans do have, in effect, a Spidey sense, and and we should be listening to those, um, and at the very least. Um, you know, investigating those. So when you're kind of working on that project and you're going, hmm, something doesn't quite feel right, I should really, you know, investigate that and think about that as opposed to the, oh, that's odd, and, you know, you do the quick fix and move on. Um, so we need to we need to kind of, you know, pay attention to those more. And um, I know for me personally, I, I do, um, sometimes I don't pay attention to my spidey senses as, as much as I should. All right, let's continue on. This next book, uh, another leadership book. Um, and this is Leadership is Half the Story by Hurwitz and Hurwitz. Now, um, the Hurwitzes is a husband and wife team, fantastic people, uh, based here in Toronto. Um, and their contention is that true leadership is equal parts leadership and equal parts followership. So this is a book about leadership, but it's really about followership. And they've got this wonderful graphic that's uh, it's like a double helix of, of um, you know, DNA, where one, one strand is uh, the leadership and one strand is the followership. And the way they position it is um, followership, leadership, it's really, it's a dance. You think about Fred and Ginger, and they would seamlessly hand off the leadership role as they went back and forth. Um, this is a huge topic on its own. In fact, we've even done uh, a, an entire webinar on its own on followership, and, and Samantha was kind enough to be a, a guest speaker for us on that one. So look for that in our, in our uh, record list. Um, so it's a, it's a really really good book, and this is, in my opinion, one of the um, uh, it's 
one of the best leadership books that's come out in, in recent time, and it's a nice, good, fresh look on it. But here's what resonated with me. Um, first of all, the piece that I already talked about, leadership is that dance. Sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. And in a really good, well-functioning uh, team environment, you're going to be handing that off back and forth. The second thing that, that I really liked with them is um, they talked about decision making and, and they put forth a, a nice decision making model. And one of the questions they pose is, are you Kirk, are you Spock? So I'm going to pose that question to you guys today. And, oh, wrong one. Sorry about that. There we go. Just open up that. So um, for those of you who don't know the Star Trek um, franchise. Kirk is the highly emotional human um, captain. He's the one on the right. And then Spock is the half Vulcan, highly logical um, on the left. And the question is, in a critical life-death decision, who do you want making the decision? Right? So Reg says, I am Spock. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I am Spurk. I I'm guessing that's a combination of Spock and Kirk. OK. Um, the question, though, is, Reg, who do you want making the decision? So um, you've got that critical life or death thing happening. Whatever it is, we need that, that, that decision quickly. Who do you want at the helm? Do you want Kirk? Do you want Spock? Who are you going to turn to to make that decision? Broadcast the results. And I've done this a few times with, with groups. Um, I've actually brought this, with their permission, into a uh, classroom exercise. And this always happens. It's about a 50-50 split. So we're looking at, uh, what do we got here, 56 and 43. Slight preference towards Kirk. Um, you know, do this with another audience, it becomes a slight preference towards Spock. But it's always that 50-50 split. And the message that I've really taken out of this is that we all have our inner Spock and we all have our inner Kirk. And there's times that we, um, you know, we, we tend to make our decisions more logically. There's times we tend to make, we'll make our decision more emotionally. So I think Reg really hit it on the nail when he says he's Spurk. Um, now, when we look at that and think about that, we need to dial up our inner Kirk or dial up our inner Spock at the appropriate times. Or we need to turn to our team members, to our Spocks or to our Kirks in our team and get their input and, and, and leverage those. Um, but the, the thing that I really liked about this was that it, it's not a simple, you know, one model is best. It's, it's the blend. It's the, the, um, the combination. Uh, so when, when I went through that uh, with the training session with the Hurwitzes and, and I, was, I was, you know, pulled, I said Kirk. And the main reason is because Kirk would always ask Spock. So I figured I was getting both. <laughs> but it's um it's an interesting way to look at it because we we do as humans we tend to make our decisions more emotionally and then we justify them with logic right and there's many times I know I've done this I'm sure you have as well or, or seen it where you've got all the data you look at it and say logically it's X but you know what my gut's telling me why and you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't as I, as I always say some days you're the bug some days you're the windshield and it's really about um, you know, what is needed in that situation and which one we should, you know, dial up and, and kind of work on. Okay. So uh, we went from a very recent book, which is only a couple years old, to a very old book, um, 1963. And um, this is a true story of survival. Um, and this book has a, a special uh, place in my heart because when I was growing up as, as a young man, um, actually a young boy really, uh, this was in our library. In fact, my father had bought this book before I was born, um, and uh, he gave it to my grandfather as a, a Christmas present, um, signed from my sister, who was, you know, then too young to write. So it's in it's in my father's pen. Um, and I remember reading this book as a child, and it just it really struck home for me. And it, it's a true story of survival. So what happened is uh, there was a, um, a a small sailing boat with um, you know, about 10 crew on it that was sailing from Tonga to, um, to uh, New Zealand. And they're out there in the middle of the Pacific at night, and um, they ran aground on the Minerva Reef. Now, the Minerva Reef is a little atoll that's in, literally in the middle of the Pacific. It's hundreds of miles from anything. And it is only exposed during low tide. So at high tide, it's a wash and there's nothing there. At low tide, it's exposed. And they ran aground in the middle of the night. 
So as they're scrambling to um, get their 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 stuff in order before that that little piece of land that they're on disappears as as the tide rolls in, uh, they notice that there's a a wrecked Japanese fishing trawler on the other side of the reef. So they they gather what they can in their arms basically and and um, you know make haste to their, what becomes their new home. So they set up camp in this fishing trawler and they they you know distill water for for fresh drinking water they catch fish for food because they've, they've, they've now got basically nothing and they were stranded there and survived for 102 days before they were finally rescued now the the way they were rescued is is very interesting now the captain of this of this boat that, that ran aground um, was very well respected in that that area of the world and it was it was really quite you know surprising that that uh, this happened on his watch and the way they were finally rescued is after somewhere around 80 days or something um, they basically kind of figured out that they weren't going to be rescued and they had to effectively rescue themselves so with the with the crude tools that they had and boards ripped off of this you know wrecked uh, Japanese fishing trawler they made a small sailing vessel um, they manufactured it, they created it and then uh, three of them sailed this hundreds of miles to uh, I think it was to Fiji if I remember correctly and that's when they were able to say okay you know here's where we are and they sent a rescue airplane um, to to pick them up and you notice on the cover of the book there's a barrel that has SOS written on it because what they were doing to help uh, you know try to uh, affect their rescue is they wrote messages on things that would float and toss them into the sea hoping that a passing ship or it would wash up on a beach somewhere or something like that um, the Royal New Zealand Navy was out searching for them and one of their search airplanes uh, was supposed to fly over the Minerva Reef and it had turned back um, I think it was running low on fuel or it, or it hit weather or the, it got called back for some reason um, and that was relatively early in, in the story when that occurred um, but here's the interesting part that really resonated when when they interviewed the captain at the very end of the book and he talked about um, you know his experience on the reef on those 102 days um, is that temporary solutions can impede the final result or, or the better result and this is that classic story of the band-aid fix that becomes the permanent fix um, we all do this right we come up with some quick little simple short band-aid fix and that becomes the new permanent now in those 102 days, um, a couple of people did die. I think there, there was ended up. Uh, I think there was about three people in the crew who who did not survive the ordeal. Um, one of which was actually the captain's son. But what he had said was, if that fishing trawler had not been there, um, they would have figured out the raft. They would have built the raft within two days because um, the the schooner that they were on, when it ran aground, it was it was in its position. The tide came up. The tide went down, the tide came up, and, and then it, it sunk to a deeper position. So they would have you know, gotten things together much, much faster. They would have fashioned a raft, and then they would have drifted, slash sailed, um, and gotten themselves to rescue. And he, he, he reckons, especially based on his experience, that had they not had the Japanese fishing trawler, the ordeal would have been a week, maybe two. Instead, it was, it was over 14 weeks. Um, so it's interesting that you know here they had this temporary solution because they had this Japanese fishing trawler they set up camp they, they started to make home in this Japanese fishing trawler and that became their new home that became the new permanent and because of that they were slow in affecting the rescue in, in affecting the you know build the raft and and let's let's sail ourselves out of here um, so it's a really really interesting tale um, if you do pick up the book uh, it's a little bit hard to find but uh, you can you can find them um, if you do pick it up, just you know, it's written by a Tongan in in um, or Tongo. Um, it's written in English, excuse me, but by a Tongan um, it, from the 1960s. So <laughs> it's you know the, the 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 style of language is is a little interesting as well. But it's it's a fantastic book, and it it really you know uh, especially for me resonated very very well. Okay. Um, we're going to go now. So we, we went. We had a newer book. We had a really old book. We're going to go to the newest book in our in our set, which is the power, the art of positive politics, by B.J. Verma. Um, 
VJ is a phenomenal author. Uh, I've been studying his work for many years. I had the, the great privilege of meeting him at, at his book launch uh, for this book um, and really, really, really like this one. Um, now, VJ, um, he's been writing on the topic of project management for years. So this is actually one one book that's actually specifically written for project managers, you know, kind of the whole for project managers by project managers thing. But his question basically is, should you be a manager or should you be a leader? And the answer is you should be both. And the power of, po or the art of positive politics really comes into focus the political side of, um, you know, running a project and, and leading the project because politics abound. Regardless of whether we're in private sector, in public sector, um, we're going to have you know politics. And and what he's really talking about is is you know in part the uh, the politics of of power and and different levels of power and and who's doing what and who has sway in these sorts of things. Um, but also just you know the 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 lowercase p of politics. The how do we work with other folks, right? And um, this was the piece that really resonated with me. And there's a section in the book where he talks about the three truths. The three truths are people make or break things. People do what is in their best interest. It's that whole WIIFM concept that we've talked about many times in our webinars over the years. And people support what they create. And I, and I remember um, you know, hearing those three for the first time and thinking, wow, that is really, really good, really deep, really, you know, very succinct and just, just you know, right on, on the mark. Um, and then he told me it was actually his mother who came up with these. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously a very brilliant woman. Um, but, you know, people make or break things. We, we think about projects. We think about changes. Change is about people changing. And projects are about delivering things. And people make those things, but people also break those things. Because when we encounter resistance, people will deliberately sabotage the product. So they see, I told you it didn't work, and you know this sort of thing. Um, people, what is we are going to do? What is in their best interest? And we've had discussions in the world of project management in our in our webinars around this whole concept of um, yes, it's going to you know increase market share and it's going to do all these wonderful things at this high level. But you know, here I am down at the front line attempting to deal with my customers, and you know what? I'm I'm going to do what's best for me, right? And and getting my job done. And people support what they create. Um, and this is that whole buy-in concept. And and I've often uh, referenced the leadership is half the story of the book we talked about earlier, where they talk about joining, where they talk about getting people to participate. And this is the huge value of getting people to participate, is that the more that they participate, the more they will support whatever it is because the, they're heavily invested, they've created it, right? Um, so really we can kind of summarize this down to say people make the project, people break the project. And I'm sure in your own experience, you can see many times where you know, it's been the people that have made or break or broken the project. Um, one of my favorite experiences around that was the Human Powered Ornithopter Project. And there we had a team of 10 people who were underperforming. So there was the team of 10 people, there were the two leaders of the project. Um, <clears throat> and the team up and quit because, you know, things weren't going well. And two guys who were actually observing the project, one was a high school student, the other was his, his father, um, they stepped in and said, "We'll we'll help you with it. Like we'll we'll help build it, you know." And that team of two people outperformed the team of ten, right? And it really resonated home for me that you know people really make or break the project, and you know how you treat your people and how you work with them. Um, again, you know, looking at these three truths, um, we need to you know sort of key into that. Okay. So we have a special bonus that, that I didn't mention at the beginning, and um, I just got to check something here. And oh no, unfortunately not. Okay, so Ori was was hoping to join us today. So Ori is the author of this wonderful book. Um, Ori works with Procept, who's our our um, our sister company, and um, uh, he was hoping to be able to step out and and join us today. So I'm guessing he's gotten tied up, but that's okay. 
Um, so this is a book uh, called Managing Stakeholder Expectations for Project Success. Very similar theme to uh, Vijay Verma's book. And in this book, he really goes into depth around how important it is to manage those stakeholders. And managing stakeholders is crucial for that project success. Um, I was hoping that, that we would have Ori on the line today to be able to uh, give us uh, his, his take on this. Um, I know that he was, he was trying to squeeze that in, so we, we appreciate the effort. Um, but, you know, looking at this book, um, oh, he has raised his hand. He is there. Sorry, one second here. Let me just, uh, I thought I didn't see him on the list. Oh, he's disappeared again on me. Enable microphone. Okay, Ori, I've enabled your microphone. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Hey. There we are. There you are, sir. I, I, I didn't recognize your, your, your long version. Yeah, my, uh, so my, uh, because I'm mobile, uh, the way I entered it, and it just didn't allow me to take anything out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're so happy you could join us today, sir. Um, Give us a quick little oh, synopsis okay. of well, why we should be reading all, this book. It's a great segue because when we talked before about the survival book, um, and you said interestingly that many temporary things become permanent, this is about managing expectations, right? And many times people try to achieve that perfection, and they say, okay, when we do it in the future, it's going to be done right, but all of a sudden that temporary becomes the future. Right, so um, that's one thing. The other thing, the book was originally written um, from a project management perspective, and then as we wrote it and edited it, the publisher told me it's more for sponsors. It's more for about how to do things that surround the project. So the whole idea was born because I realized that in every given project that I became part of or led, I have very, very limited sphere of influence, and I was trying to look for the areas where I can make a difference. And I realized these areas were not so much the scope, time, and cost that everybody was look were looking at, those tangible things. My sphere of influence was on the behind the scenes, so I could call these things um, the things that matter, right? Uh, one of them was managing expectations because I realized I have a lot of power and control over how much effort I put into that. And managing the expectations is the underlying stuff, right? So I'm looking here at elements related to communications and to risk management, right? So yes, there are some hard skills over there, but at the end, I've been involved in two types of projects more, but specifically the two that matter. Sometimes I delivered successful products, but the stakeholders were not necessarily happy. And in other times it was the opposite. Our product was uh, in some cases not very good, but somehow I managed to keep the customers happy. And then how did we do that? So that was the idea. It goes a little bit deeper than the traditional uh, one of the mill books and, uh, and concepts around project management is say, okay, what are the things that I really can look into and what are the things that really give me an opportunity to shine over other people who try to do the same work as I do? Um, David, does it answer the question? Because I can keep talking. <laughs> I think, and, and I really love your, your, your comment there around um, when you were able to deliver a project where the product is perhaps inferior, but yet you had very satisfying stakeholders. And that, I, I, I totally agree. There's projects where I've delivered a very simple product that you look and go, there's no complexity here. There's no fancy bells and whistles. But people are doing backflips and how happy they are with, with it. And, and that really re made me realize a similar lesson that, you know what, it's about, um, it's about, you know, how people are expecting that. Um, so, Ori, I'm just going to, uh, if I can oh, ask sorry, you to I'm trying to run away from, from, from the noise. Thank you, David. 
<laughs> run faster. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Um, so, and, and thank you, Ori, for, for squeezing that in because uh, Ori is out on a client engagement today, so he's literally doing this on his lunch in the, in the food court. <laughs> um, so there's, there's some real dedication to, to us. Uh, um, so what resonates for me with this, this book, and as, as Ori talked about, um, time, scope, and budget, those are easy to measure. Right, and and those are the easy measurable pieces, and and I think sometimes we get a little too distracted on um, on those items, and and you know I don't blame the the PMs as much because so many times we're judged and we're um, rated and and sometimes even remunerated based on you know on time on scope and on budget, um, you know we have penalties for being late or going over budget and you know things like this, but they are not the most important factors because we've all been on these projects where. We've delivered on time, on scope, and on budget, but the project was still a failure because the product, the thing, was not used or adopted, or it, it didn't provide the value that we were, you know, kind of hoping it would. The most important thing is to manage those stakeholders, and to to kind of build on what Ori said around the whole, you know, we built, we delivered a product that maybe wasn't as uh, sophisticated, um, as um, as as you know we would necessarily like. But yet it was it was very well received and and my my favorite um, story on that is I I'd done a CRM um, <clears throat> for a client it was a small Canadian division of a of a multinational and um, they were so pleased with it that they shared it with their their cohorts in the in the U S and the U S said this is awesome and they shipped me down there to rework it for the larger audience and then they shared it with head office in Geneva and Geneva said this is better than what the Germans gave us. And I was about to get shipped over to Geneva to to expand it to that global thing, and you know they kind of realized, hey, this is a, a one man shop, and you know I was an independent contractor at the time, and you know when you're looking at an enterprise level product that's going to you know be kind of driving a core piece of the business, it's not your best decision to go with that. So we all agreed that uh, I needed to step back out of that, but it really does highlight that whole piece around managing those stakeholder expectations and giving them you know what they want and what they need. Um, is really key. So Ori, I, I greatly appreciate and thank you for uh, taking some time out of your lunch today and, and letting you get back to your client. Um, uh, again, appreciate that. So just to, to come back to this opening thought, I'm only as good as my last book. Um, and this is this is Catherine referring to books that she reads. Um, so, you know, there's lots of great lessons out there. You can find them in, in some un unlikely places. Um, you know, there's really good PM books out there, such as you know Managing Stakeholder Expectations and the Art of, of Positive Politics. But there's also some really good books out there that go, that are outside of you know the true PM piece. Um, I just want to say in closing here, um, as I was putting this webinar together, um, I was you know trying to find the list of the books uh, to include, and and I was having a hard time you know getting down to a short enough list that we could effectively do that within the hour. So I have more in, in the in my back pocket. Um, I'm going to invite you to email me uh, your your recommendations, your thoughts, because I always love to pick up those and, and look at new books. Um, one Catherine recently recommended for me was um, uh, I think it was the Art of Feedback, or no, Thank You for the Feedback. I think is the title of the book. It's all about how to give and, and receive feedback. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to picking that up in, as my next read, and you'll probably see that in in one of my future webinars because I'm I think we're going to do this as a um, uh, not not a, a regular series, but an ongoing. We'll pop in book reviews once in a while. Just want to give a quick shout out to International Project Management Day. It's happening Thursday, November the first. So first Thursday, November as always. We're going to be hosting an event in North York Memorial Community Hall. I'm going to be giving a talk personally on um, uh, on PMOs. Uh, we've got several other speakers. I think Ori might actually be doing uh, one of the talks as well. So uh, look for that. The link on screen is active, so if you want to, if you're interested, please click on the link. Um, and if you uh, if you have some issue with the link or anything, just you know, fire us a quick email, and um, uh, we can send you that. So this brings us to the end. Uh, I've got the the comment, the chat box open. Chat box is open. If you have any comments or questions, uh, the PDU code is there. Thank you so much. Uh, let us know if this format worked for you. Uh, if it did, we'll happily redo it sometime in the future. Um, and if you have any books to recommend, uh, either for future reviews or just, you know, here's a good book to recommend because I'm um, always looking for my next read. Um, currently working on a really thick one, Peter Senge, The the Fifth Dimension. It's all about learning organizations, which uh, I think we could probably do a, oh, sorry, fifth discipline. Um, 
And I think we could probably do an entire webinar series on that one alone. So um, thank you so much. Our next series starting next month is around coaching. Uh, I think we've got six, five or six in that series. And we're going to start off with just putting some context around what is coaching, you know, versus managing and, uh, you know, to put that into some context. And we're going to finish off that series with an actual live coaching session. So we've got a, uh, a coaching practice here at Title Shift. And we're going to get a couple of our different coaches to be uh, guest host or guests on those various webinars. Um, uh, so thank you so much. And.